good evening friends happy evening today we have a program online lecture program on the topic only one earth living sustainably in harmony with nature today's program is uh, being held it's a endowment program as we all know uh, led by united nations environment program in 1972 world environment day is celebrated on the 5th <coughs> june every year to raise awareness that de degrading environment conditions and to encourage people globally to take positive environmental actions to help create a better future and also the thisapkal society mysore limited it's a company a sister organization of uh, indian institute of world culture has initiated a program in memory of paul harris the father and founder of uh, rotary organization worldwide each year we held a lecture on world environment day today we have we are uh, conducting this program we have with us uh, shrimati surabhi tomar uh, environmentalist is a she is a tech entrepreneur by background she is living in bangalore now in full time non profit work in environment and entrepreneurship uh, in the name of uh, organization one vote koti vriksha andolan one crore sapling project on behalf of indian world institute of world culture and also on behalf of all of us present here and also online viewers i welcome shrimati turbi surabhi tomar environment listed to this uh, i today's evening function uh environment uh, uh, in the sanatana dharma we have uh, so many things to do uh, not on the particular day we remember earth we remember earth every day by on the way when we get up in the early morning out of bed so we ke samudra vasane devi parvatasthana mandale vishnu patnir namastubhyam padasparsham shivasame so we remember earth which has given birth to all of us so every day not like uh, each uh, program every day program or environment program conducted every day every year on, not only on this day every day we remember we also the subject matter is very good living sustainably in harmony with nature nature we uh, actually we pray uh, early papal tree and also neem tree every day uh, so we remember in uh, even uh, the uh, we <coughs> sometimes we i walk in uh, lalbag people find out uh, the owl also because owl is uh, uh, regarded as uh, lakshmi's uh, vehicle so even owl also is being respected so that is our uh, sanatana dharma uh, slowly we are uh, forgetting as uh, people like uh, surabhi tomar i think uh, they are educating the people in this uh, regard on behalf of uh, indian sort of world culture uh, once again i welcome her and also request her to give her lecture thank you i request jayanti manohar give to to ధన్యవాదగలు ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಇವತ್ತು ನಾನು ಕನ್ನಡ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತನಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ಕ್ರೌಡ್ ಇದೆ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಾಖ್ಲಿ ವೆಂಕಟೇಶ್ ಜಿ ಫಾರ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ every such program that we organize is very very important because it takes our word forward to people what is our word it is related to environment and it is related to our culture indian culture and environment 
cannot be separated. Since 5,000 years ago, we have been together. World culture, Indian culture, and environment has been together. Environment topic is a very huge topic. We can talk about it in many, many different ways. However, today we will split it up into four parts. It's a very long talk, so four parts is what we will talk about. First is what, what is happening? The current situation of environment, whether it is in Bangalore, whether it is in India, or world over. What exactly is the situation currently? A lot of us know the buzzwords because media has been very good in talking about all the bad things that have been happening. But why is it happening is the second part. Third part that we will focus on is how we can fix it. What is our role in it? And the fourth part is I'm hoping that we will have a small discussion about it because everybody has their own views of how we can help fix the environment. So what is happening? Again, as I said, there are multiple things which are happening in environment. When we talk about it, environmentalists like you and us can talk about many, many things. Many topics like pollution underground, pollution in the air, or um, resources that are depleting, species that are dying off. However, today we will speak about only three things. One is climate change. Climate change is a very, very big problem. It's a very concerning problem because it is something that will affect us not just theoretically, but physically in the next 30 to 40 years. A lot of people, uh, the marginalized people are already getting affected with it. We will go deeper into it a bit later on. Second part is pollution, but specifically polythene and plastic pollution. How is the polythene pollution affecting us? And the third part is what we call upyog versus upbhog, taking care of resources and giving back to the world. Climate change, we will come to it. Climate change is, if we split it into two parts, um, we can talk about rising temperatures. And because of that, we can talk about uh, sea levels rising. I'll not try to give numbers because a lot of regular people will be uh, listening to our talk and not just researchers and scientists. Uh, if we talk about rising temperatures, and if I were to draw out a graph in this room, so the variance in temperature, and Earth cools and heats up on a regular basis, it has been going on for millions of years. And if I were to draw out a graph in this room, uh, and the variance in temperature with the graph spikes and bottoms were to be, say, the size of this chair, then the current spike in temperature over the last 50 to 60 years has been four stories high. That is the amount of difference in temperature that has happened. I'm giving this type of example so that we can understand that there has been a humongous rise in temperature and that is very, very scary. Within Bangalore itself, and Bangalore is the best city to live in in India when it comes to weather and temperature. Everybody talks about how great the weather is. But within Bangalore itself, 20 years ago, and all of us sitting here have been here around 20 years. 20 years ago, we did not need a fan. This room itself does not have a fan or an AC. But now, almost every second house has a AC. Forget a fan, if everybody has a fan in their house. But everyone has an AC. And that's bad because it's not just a, a climate change problem, it also gives back into the heating problem. So AC itself is bad. Rising temperatures, it's not just that temperature will increase, it's gonna make us feel uncomfortable and it will make us feel hot. It has consequences when we step out of just the city. 
what is happening with rising temperatures is that sometimes, some places, there are humongous spikes in temperature. Recently, we heard about the first world problem. In Canada, there was a heat dome that got created. And uh, a few people died because of it. That is also a result of climate change. We don't hear these stories coming out of Africa and many other third world countries because we don't like to hear stories coming out of third world countries. But these things are happening. Even within India, in March, one of the highest temperatures has been recorded in India this year. What will happen next year or in 10 years? How will the agricultural crops that are getting grown, how will they survive? This has a direct impact on us. Even if we are very selfish and we think about we don't care about the birds or animals or anything else on earth, or even humans who are not related to us, our food source is going to stop. So first, the marginalized are going to get affected. And secondly, after that, the regular middle class will get affected. And of course, after that, everybody else will get affected too. Second part, if I talk about, is what happens when temperature rises. If we take a small cube of ice, it melts very fast. If we take a large cube of ice, it melts slowly but then it increases the pace at which it is melting. That is what is happening with our polar ice and with our glaciers. Polar ice melting is going to directly cause an increase in the height of sea levels. Already in certain parts of Indian coastal line, we have reports of people, fishermen communities, people who have been displaced their entire houses, their entire community houses have been submerged in water, and there is no coming back. Once that got flooded with seawater, it did not go back. It has already started happening. If we do not stop now, the same thing is going to happen to coastal cities as big as Mumbai, Chennai, or countries like Bangladesh, Entire countries like Maldives, Lakshadweep Islands, Andaman Islands, all of them will get submerged. Again, we are sitting in Bangalore. We feel very safe in the very great weather, and uh, we feel that it, it's not really affecting us. But it does affect us. What will happen is if Bangladesh gets submerged, what will, have to, what will happen to the community there? to the lakhs of people who get displaced, they are going to migrate. When they migrate, where are they going to come? They're going to come to India. When they come to India, they will need resources. They will need um, water, food. They will need jobs. They will need a place to live. And this fight for resources is what causes wars. If we think that uh, it is not happening, again, I will say it has already happened in Syria. In Syria, we had uh, a large-scale war, which caused civil war, which caused people to migrate, which caused a problem for European countries who thought they were very immune to migrations and uh, civil wars. And they had to take people in. So we have to consider and connect the dots between all of these things, that rising temperatures is causing displacement, which is causing wars, which is causing all these resource problems. One very concerning thing had recently come in the news. In one of the stock exchanges of US, water securities are being traded. Future of water is being traded. It is definitely not Indian culture to do that. In Indian culture, we feel that water belongs to everyone. It is one of the laws in India. We cannot um, privatize water. And we should not privatize water. When we go down that route, this is what happens. We start trading on the future of water itself, which should be a basic uh, thing which is granted to everybody as a right. Second part of what will melt is the glaciers. 
Within India, we know the biggest glaciers are in the Himalayan region, which are the source of the main rivers in India. Brahmaputra, Ganga, Yamuna, the Indus, they are all coming from the Himalayas. We will be feeling that there is no drought coming in the Himalayas because we are only hearing about the floods. But where are the floods coming from? They're coming partly because the glaciers are melting. When the glaciers will melt for the next 30 to 40 years, there will be a lot of flooding. Not just the ones we have seen in the last 10 years. There will be bigger and there will be a lot more whether they're in Yamuna, Ganga, Brahmaputra, or Indus. After that, once the glaciers are gone, we will have a situation of drought in the next 50 to 60 years in all of North India. And the most populous region of the entire world is in North India. Where will the food come from? Where will the water come from? Where will the people go? All of these demographic, agricultural, economical problems are related to environment. So that is the dire situation related to climate change. Related to pollution, as I said, I will only speak about plastic and polythene. Um, I will give a very small statistic, even though I said I will not. 98% of rural waste, waste that was generated in rural households, used to be recycled or reused. This was a study done in 98. However, I have been to Manipur, I have been to Arunachal Pradesh, I have been to um, small, small villages in Uttar Pradesh, Utt Uttarakhand, uh, Maharashtra, Kerala, Tamil Nadu. There is one thing common we are seeing everywhere. Their, their rivers, ponds, lakes, uh, what we call the Raj Kalways, the small waterways, are being clogged and polluted with polythene and plastic. That is the only thing which is being created as pollution. And we might think that after some time it will disintegrate and that will be done. Firstly, it takes around 600 to 1000 years for a, a polythene bag to disintegrate. And I'm saying disintegrate, not decompose. What happens is it breaks up into very tiny, tiny, small, small pieces. What happens to the small, small, tiny pieces of plastic, these molecules? They get absorbed back into the plants. If we go outside of Bangalore, on the outskirts, there are a lot of lakes which are getting sewage water from Bangalore inside them. What happens with that is that uh, farmers are getting a lot of nutrient-filled um, sewage water for their crops. They're growing these palak and green leafy vegetables there. All these crops are absorbing harmful chemicals and especially polythene and plastic molecules. And they're coming back to us and we are eating them and they're getting into our blood. And once that polythene molecule enters, or plastic molecule enters our bloodstream, it never comes out. Polythene molecules have been found even in fetuses. It has been found in blood, but the shocking thing is that it has been found in fetuses, because the fetus is separated from the mother by the placenta. So there is a barrier that should be cleaning it out, but still it is not because human bodies or no other living being is actually made to filter out polythene or pol plastic. It's just a 100-year-old problem. We have found plastic molecules even in drinking mineral water. Now, what happens when plastic molecules get into our blood? It causes hormonal problems. We have seen a rise in cases of people having thyroid issues. We have seen a rise in cases of people having problems, having uh, fertility problems, having babies, and cancer. It is very difficult 
to pinpoint what cancer, um, why cancer happens. But there is a direct link by multiple studies that shows that plastic and polythene molecules within uh, the human blood causes cancer. Now that is on human bodies. What happens to all the plastic which is not disintegrating and it is on, lying on our roadside? What happens to that? Our cows come and eat it. Dogs come and eat it. There was a vet who did a surgery on a small calf and found 40 kgs of plastic inside its stomach. 40 kgs. There was another uh, body of a whale that was found and they found around 100 kgs of plastic in its stomach. It had died because of it. Luckily for us, India is one of the least consumers in the world per person of plastic and polythene. We are actually very blessed with the fact that most of us carry our own handbag when we go vegetable shopping. We carry cloth bags. We don't cover our food with plastic uh, cello wraps. We don't like doing any of that. We prefer uh, steel boxes rather than having plastic boxes. And even if we forget plastic, if I focus only on polythene, which is the biggest problem, single-use plastic is the biggest problem. Even if we focus just on that, Indians are the least consumers. That's a very good thing. However, the flip side of that is that Indians are the worst in the world when it comes to disposal of plastic. If I were to say that India is in the uh, five percentile, the least in terms of consuming of polythene and plastic, then we are in the 95th percentile in terms of disposal. We all know that. We have seen it in our roadways. We have seen it right outside of our houses. We have seen those straws that people just throw out of their windows. And even if that is not done, we currently do not have the infrastructure to be able to do this. And if we were to consider that we should start some dharna pradarshan outside and ask the government to create an infrastructure for plastic or polythene um, disposal, it's not feasible. It's going to take lakhs of crores to be able to build such an infrastructure. Is it not a better way that we should just stop the consumption? There is one more small tidbit of research I will say, but it takes us in a different direction. When we go away from a city center, the cases of anemia decrease because we are no longer drinking any of these uh, plastic polythene aloo chips or uh, any straw wale, any uh, junk food. We are having healthy food when we go out. That is our Indian culture. Can we not go back to eating healthy food how we used to? We have fruit walas outside who give in the kele ka uh, patta or the leaf bowls. The leaf bowls are environmentally friendly. That is our culture. This is something that we need to take to the world. Can we do that? It's not part of this part. I'll come back to it in the third part, which is what we need to do. This is what I spoke about, what is happening in the world currently. Climate change and pollution. Uh, Another part that I had mentioned was upyog versus upbhog. I think very briefly I will touch on it. It is that uh, we are consuming a lot more and giving back a lot less. In Gita itself, a few thousand years ago, it was written that we should give back to nature only as much as we have taken. This is in Gita. There are shlokas in Rig Veda and uh, Doc, Miss Doctor is sitting here, she will know a lot better than all of us, that even in Rig Veda, there are a lot of quotes about how we should give back to nature. So as I started off with, Indian culture 
cannot be separated from environment. It is part of us. It is part of who we are. Every single day what I do has to be environmentally friendly. We are all very blessed with the fact that we are Indians. So for us to make the change is not very difficult. We are very used to switching off the lights. We are very used to switching off the taps. We are very, very lucky to be Indians. Because to be able to change, and I'm very sorry to say that, but an American uh, will be very difficult. They are used to having uh, motion detection lights. And if the motion detection doesn't work, the light will stay on the entire night, even if there's not a single person sitting in the entire room, or entire building, in fact. So second part that I will get on to is why is this happening? As I mentioned, this is uh, what we called Upbhog versus Upyog. If uh, some of us do know Sanskrit, so Upyog is using uh, as much as we need. And Upbhog is using more than what we need. One is based in greed, one is based in we will take as much as we can and as much as we can afford. And one is based in only as much as is needed for survival. Some of the world's um, biggest billionaires actually could be a good example on that. Warren Buffett still stays in a very small house, not in a humongous mansion. And that is an example of upyog and not upbhog. And of course, Indian to all these caricatures here, you can give one example after the other. We never take more than what is needed. And we never show off. That is part of our culture. When we start taking more, that is when problems arise. Uh, a lot of us in Bangalore are very used to the dharna pradarshans that go on about highway plantations. And uh, that is needed, that's very much needed. But have we thought about how much and how many trees get cut when we buy new houses or we rent another second house or a third house or we decide to build another building for any other resource? We are cutting out trees when we are expanding the size of Bangalore. When we have more than two kids, we are expanding the need of our uh, family. At a personal level, we need to reduce. One more statistic, around 18% of Indian species, are, Indian tree species, are dying off. Again, this seems like it's not a big problem. But recently, about a few days back, I was with a person, and he was talking about how one of the mangoes that he used to eat as a child is no longer available anywhere. And we tried finding out with a few horticultural people, but uh, they could not find it, because that entire species has died off. Similarly, with a lot of these species that have died off, there could be Ayurvedic medicines that could have been found with it, there could have been um, maybe some medicines or maybe some, um, some better oxygen creating things. Maybe some animals and birds have died off because of these tree species having died off. This is all a loss of our own culture. This is happening because we are going away from our own languages. Hindi, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, they're all similar languages. Because culturally, we are the same. And when we are going away from these languages, we are forgetting our base, we are forgetting our own culture, and we are getting into a Western culture of greed and not need. Few examples, in our culture, at almost every festival, we used to plant trees or some sapling. We used to do Prakriti Vandana. And it doesn't matter which religion we were, whether you were a Buddhist or a Jain or a Muslim, Indian Muslim, or 
uh, a Hindu, no matter what your culture was, your religion was, we used to plant trees. Dharmic Vatikai are, base, are the base of our culture. And we are going away from it. One of the things that we used to uh, really uphold, one of the people who we used to really help out, and we used to say that they are the best in the society, were the people who would create lakes, or give money for creating ponds, or give money for creating step wells, kalyanis, wells. These are what will save us in the future. When that drought comes in the next 50 to 60 years in North India, these kalyanis, these step wells, these ponds, these lakes are the ones that will save us because we will have underground reservoir of water. So how can we stop this? How can we help? There is a PPP model, personal, then professional, and then public. In our culture, again, we talk about swim. What have we done? You have a complete right to ask me that I'm standing here and giving a very long, boring lecture, but what have I done for the environment? Have I planted trees? How much water am I using in my own house? Have I recycled that water? What have I done for the zameen, the ground? What happens to the plastic or the polythene which is getting used in our house, in my house? Everyone has a right to question me, as I have a right to question every single one of you. Because we have to start with self, personal. And then we will go on to professional. All of us are associated with some organization or the other in some capacity. What can we do at that level. And the third is public. When we go to public, after we have done these steps, then we can create a public awareness, then we can create a, a public movement. That is what we have to do. That is the 3P model. Now what do we uh, do at the household level? Can we make our own houses into what we called Harith Ghar, but here I will call it eco-friendly house. Can we do that? So if I were to say that I have to create a eco-friendly house, what will come into mind? Maybe have a few tulsi plants around the house. Uh, maybe stop using plastic or polythene in the house. So there is a five-step formula that a lot of people around the country are using to create what is called a Harid Ghar or eco-friendly house. So we start with paid. In paid, can we take two steps of creating a Ghar Ghar nursery? Because it is monsoon season, I, that's why I'm starting with uh, tree plantation. Uh, we were talking a bit earlier about how a lot of these old species are dying off. But when we go to the parks or forests close to us, can we collect the seeds from there and just bring it into our house and in small, maybe plastic container or uh, something that you were going to recycle or a plastic uh, milk pouch, can we grow these seeds into small saplings? It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be five such uh, tree saplings, or it can be 75, depending on how good of a gardener you are. So can we do that? Can we do Mane Mane nursery, Ghar Ghar nursery? Every house have a small, has a small nursery. If we can do that, then we will be able to not just bring back the species which are at the brink of extinction, but we will be able to create a large repository of saplings within Bangalore and within India. At the same time, there is a lot of biodiversity which is getting reduced because we are not, uh, we are cutting down trees, we are cutting down forests and building a house there. So for the small insects, like butterflies, honeybees, can we create small gardens 
in our own houses. If we have, if you're lucky enough to have a house, if we can make a small garden uh, where butterflies can come, where insects can come, and if we have balconies, if we can do the same with a potted garden. In my own house, I have Anar and Neem and a few others in a balcony. So it is absolutely possible. In terms of water, there are five steps that we should be doing. One, a lot of these most of us already do because we are Indians. The first is, can we take a bath with only half a bucket of water? Many of us are used to taking a bath with um, showers and we keep going on and on until the entire hot water finishes and then we are saying, okay, fine, now we will give up and come out. Rather than that, the only reason I'm saying a bucket because it can help us measure the amount that we're using. We lose track of time when we are in a <laughs> taking a shower. So can we take a bath with half a bucket of water? If it seems improbable, there is a video I will share later on of a person who has shown that he can take a bath with one liter of water, twice. It's a YouTube video, very amusing and interesting at the same time. He takes a bath in the entire video uh, with just one liter of bottle, this, this much amount of water, twice and with soap and shampoo, everything is done in just this much water. So it's absolutely possible. In fact, if you think about it, uh, in hospitals and nurse, the nurses come and give the sponge bath. I'm not suggesting sponge baths for us, but we can still take with half a bucket of water. So in terms of water, can we do that? First is half a bucket of water. Second is, when our guests come at home, we have a habit of giving uh, a full glass of water. Whether they have asked for it or not, we will go put it in front of them. Most of the time, they don't drink it, or to be very polite, they will take a sip of water and put it back. And what happens to that water? We throw it away. Same like this, I will try to finish this bottle, but if I had been given just a small, tiny sip, maybe I will keep refilling it to my requirement. So if we, and we have to multiply this. We are all just small drops in the ocean. So if we multiply this over the billion population that we have, that's a lot of water that is getting saved. That is a lot of resource reduction from the Kaveri that we are keep asking from. One background again I will give. Earlier we never used to take water from Kaveri. This is only a 50, 60 year old uh, problem. And once we started then, so of course we will keep increasing and asking more and more. Bangalore used to be self-reliant. We used to have more than 2,000 ponds and lakes. Now we're left with only around 210. That's it. And that too filled with sewage water, so we cannot drink it nor take a bath with it. So can we reduce this at our own house? Can we reduce the amount of water which we are serving to people? These are small steps which most of us already do. Third is leakage. World over, uh, around 40% of water that is wasted is through tap drippings, whether it is in pipelines or in households. A lot of times in our own house also, we see the tap dripping, but we ignore it, okay, chalega, kon bulaega plumber ko, you know, plumber, calling the plumber, it's itself a headache. But we do need to, as a responsibility and as a duty. In the Indian constitution, not only is water a right, but it is also a duty. Duty means we have to do it. It's our job in the constitution that we have to save it. The fourth part is going back to our roots. Is it possible that we reduce the number of chemicals that are getting out from our houses? A uh, little background again, I will paint the picture for you what happens to the water that goes out of our houses. Um, I'm sure if I were to ask all of you where the water is going, you will say that it goes into a sewage treatment plant. Firstly, remember that it is a sewage treatment plant. It is not a chemical treatment plant. That is one. Secondly, 
the water, especially in Bangalore and almost in every city and uh, village in India, is not going to sewage lines. Our sewage lines at most places are very old and deteriorating. They are going and intermingling illegally into stormwater drains. Stormwater drains go directly into our ponds, lakes, and rivers. They are not supposed to be treated. They can't be treated. No STP, sewage treatment plant, can be put on them. So all that stuff from our house is going directly into the river. And when we look at uh, Vrishabhavati River and we complain about it, we should first look at ourselves because it is from our houses which is coming. So what can we do to reduce the amount of chemicals? And I'm specifically saying chemicals because that is something that can't be fixed coming out of our own houses. And again, I will say we are very lucky that we are Indians because if I were to talk about shampoo, just a few couple of generations ago, what did we use to use for shampoo? Rita, Shikakai, Amla. What did we use for tooth, uh, toothpaste? Tooth powder. Our own naturally made, every part of India has different uh, formulae, but that is what we used to use. And it was much, much better and healthier than the toothpaste that we are currently using. The soap, what did we used to use? Uh, in North India, we call it uktan. Here also, haldi, basin, rita powders, orange peel powders, that is what we use. We used to use. If we can go just go back to one or two generations back, we will be able to reduce the amount of chemicals coming out of our houses. Couple of the new inventions that have been done are uh, bioenzymes. Many, many household people are now creating bioenzymes. They take orange peels and create enzymes out of them, and that they use these in uh, inspect of the um, phenyl. So floor washing, bathroom cleaning is being done by bioenzymes, naturally made at homes. You can buy it also. I know many people who are also creating businesses out of this. So as the fourth point in water, can we reduce uh, chemicals or stop chemicals at least inside our houses? And it will be good for us also. A lot of us, like including me, are lo losing hair. So if we go back to our Shikakai, Avla, and Rita's, we will stop the hair fall also. That's what the Ayurvedic doctors also keep telling us. The fifth point of water is reduce consumption. Absolutely. Even in our washing machines, see if we can reuse the water within our houses. Now, in Zameen, within the eco-friendly house, uh, what can we do to protect our um, land? So first and foremost is, to stop polythene and plastic pollution, we have to stop polythene getting out of our houses. If I were to ask what is garbage, you will never include newspaper in garbage. Why? Because it has value. Can I tell you that polythene itself has value? There are many companies that we have uh, visited. They have these plastic or polythene to fuel conversion machines, and they're sitting idle. The reason is that we are mixing our polythene and plastic in the garbage, and once it is dirty, they cannot use it. If we can only segregate it, the segregation of polythene and single-use plastic can create value out of it. Then it is like newspaper, then we sell it. And the rest of it is organic waste. Organic waste is not bad. It gets composted. There are many composting plants in Bangalore and across India. And if, even if you don't, it goes into a landfill, it will compost there. It's then manure. It is nothing bad. So a suggestion is an eco brick. What is an eco brick? You take a, a plastic bottle like this, 
or if you don't use plastic bottles at all, you can just take any bag and collect every single piece of plastic and polythene, single-use plastic and polythene, and put it in there. Do not let it go into the garbage. When you're not putting it into garbage, then it has value. When it is filled, then it is called an eco-brick. Then there are many, many uses of it. There are houses that have been made out of it. In Arunachal Pradesh, we just recently saw they made a, a school, like a sitting area out of these. Every single child brought it from their house after one month of filling the polythene and single-use plastic. And using that, they made a, a mud and eco-brick mixture and a sitting area. Similarly, in Uttarakhand, we have seen an eco-brick park. In Gujarat also, we have seen an entire eco-brick park come up. They are stopping all of this polythene and plastic going into the landfill. And a great example is right here in Bangalore, our airport, BIL airport, has used polythene and plastic. They collected it using plastic BQ campaign and they put it in their roads. Nitin Gadkariji has very nicely and very graciously a few years back announced that they want plastic to be included in the roads. And that is great because that is stopping it from going into the landfills. It may gets mixed with tar and it stays there. Second is we have to segregate our waste. Even our electronic waste, even our polythene, plastic, everything should be segregated at home itself. Every single thing in our garbage has value. So it's basically money that you're throwing away. <laughs> Third part of Zameen is can we grow uh, a bagia, like a small garden? So your water, which is getting recycled from our house, the washing machine or any other water that gets recycling and go there. Uh, the waste that you are composting as the fourth point within Zameen, that can go in there. So it brings everything together. If we can have a small garden, whether it's in a small balcony or if it's in a, a large house, if you're lucky enough to have a large house. We have seen a house in Bombay, and Bombay is notorious for very small, tiny houses. Uh, they had a very tiny balcony, maybe this size. That was the width of it. And they created a wonderful, like around 100 plus species of plants were there. So absolutely, it is possible we can do this. And we have to do this. Uh, the third part is related to energy. So again, as I said, we already do a lot of this. Can we switch off the lights when we go out of the room? Can we try to have solar energy? There are many companies that have come up, especially in Bangalore, that give us an option of cheap solar energy. It will be cheaper than even the regular energy that we use. Uh, third part of energy is, can we switch to LED bulbs? Just switch, making that tiny change makes a humongous difference in energy consumption. We are very lucky that Narendra Modi ji has been one of the pioneers and the front runners in the entire world for having switched over from coal to uh, solar and wind, renewable energy. In fact, we, a goal that we were supposed to reach in 2030, nationally we have already reached last year. So we are very lucky to do that. But this will not mean anything if we keep consuming more. Achha, you know that light is cheap, electricity is cheap, it's renewable, nothing is happening, we'll increase production, uh, we'll increase our consumption. Our consumption has to remain low and only then will it be effective. The last part is animals, insects, birds. We have cut down forests and we have taken over their land. We are the most populous uh, mammal in the whole world, and we have really literally taken over their homes. So the one obligation that we can do for them is at least put out water. 
So with that, we can create an eco-friendly house. Just these five points, water, land, energy, plants, trees, and animals. So with that, I will finish the third part of how we can help. And the last part is the uh, discussion if we can have. I would really like to hear what everyone thinks and does in their own homes. So again, I will say we are very lucky to be Indians. Uh, starting 1st of July, we have a policy which says that single-use plastic will be banned across India. So none of the straws, this is considered recyclable, so not this, but single-use plastic, uh, the thermocol, that will not be allowed. The, you know, you go, get those tetra packs, outside of that is the straw, not allowed. All of these things are going to be banned from July 1st. But that's the good news that we will get very happy with and we will continue using our polythene bags. What we have to remember is that laws do not change human behavior. We have to go back to what we used to do and we have been doing cloth bags, not using uh, disposable containers. What is our responsibility? That we have to focus on. I was going to get one book on water laws of India, then I decided against it, but next time I will show it to you. It is a this thick book on all the water laws of India. We have all the laws possible, but we are not aware and we are not following and we are going away from our culture of upyog and not upyog. So very great question. Our government is luckily doing a lot currently, but uh, the onus comes on us. We have to do it. That's a very valid question. Uh, if you understand Hindi a little bit, there is a slogan, Jan Jagran se Nitiyan Badal Diyan which is that when people are aware and people change, that's when the laws change. As I just said, laws and uh, implementation of those laws will not be able to help. If I, this same law, this July one, uh, they tried implementing this a few years back. People were outraged. A lot of regular people with lobbies went to the government and stopped it, and they had to revert back. So it is we who have to change. If you see me carrying a, a cloth bag everywhere and not using a disposable container anywhere, then you will also do this. If I were to see you wearing uh, khadi clothes, next time I will also wear it, and not nylon clothes, I, I will also do it. So, jan jagran se nitya badalti hai in Hindi. Land, 
you are so right. This, what you have said is something which is very close to my own heart, that we keep saying don't use polythene. But if we are saying that, then what is the alternative? Not in terms of cloth bags, but when we go to large scale manufacturing, for example, the textile people, textile manufacturers, when they have to ship a container, they have to use plastic to wrap things. So what is the alternative if we are going to ban that? So that is something that our researchers and our entrepreneurs have to come up with, with solutions. Uh, one amazing person, uh, Ashwat Hegde from Bangalore, a young person, 20 year old something, 25 maybe, year old maybe, he has created a company. He creates uh, compostable plastic bags and he calls them plastic, they're not really plastic bags, out of cornstarch. Another one we saw in Bombay, they use sea algae, seaweed, and create these plastic looking type of bags out of um, sea algae. So these alternatives have to come up with by researchers and entrepreneurs. This is something India really needs to push forward on. And people like you and me who might be in touch with entrepreneurs have to help them. That infrastructure has to come around. Absolutely, you are right. Yes. Correct. But in this aspect, where everyone is agreeing, I have seen that spot. So we have a thought that how is this is so rapid, and but this still is there. So I think if you can understand this, there is some hope for the future. That's a very interesting anthropological question. I'm not an expert to answer it, but I will speculate. Uh, one of the stories I love telling is that, uh, do you know the word shampoo? actually comes from the word champi. They came to India, they took champi, they looked at our own way of shampooing, taking care of hair, they went back, created something else out of it, came back and marketed it. So maybe the question to ask is, are we great consumers of um, marketing and not great producers of marketing? Our tooth powders, our shampoos, the natural shampoos that we have. They're all wonderful, but we are not marketing them. Why not? You go, then they'll be sitting in chickpeat in one corner, maybe a very dingy looking shop. I don't have access to it. I might not go there. If I were to tell you tomorrow all these things that I've told you about switching to not chemical free, you will not be able to do it very sure, assuredly, because you don't have access to them. Where will you buy the tooth powder from? But also, there is no continuity. Yes. When you start building something, you know, in fact, you cannot keep not available. Exactly. So this is another example of when you talk about uh, laws. We step away from laws and we step into the consumer and marketing uh, products. It comes down to us. If we are not asking for it, a few people who are already knowledgeable like you are asking for it, but not everybody. It's not cool anymore because the marketing people don't show it as being cool anymore. So then there's no market. The companies are going to shut it down.
I agree with uh, the government helping to a certain extent, but one other thing that we need to remember is that in India, we used to have decentralized things for everything. In fact, uh, the oils that we are using now and the problems that we are facing with the oils, it wasn't there in the 1960s or 70s. We used to have localized separate, separate shops where we used to go give our um, rice or other stuff and that they used to give us the oil back. And uh, the lobbies were able to get the laws changed and create a bad name for them. And now only the large oil manufacturers are present. Same way with the tooth powder. We don't need large manufacturers like Yuiko Vajandanti. They're amazing, but we don't need them. We need to be able to just generate it in any household. Um, we were in Karwar visiting a small village, and there a small Anath ashram was able to create uh, this tooth powder, the black charcoal one that you're talking about. And it's not tough at all. Very easy. In two days, they created uh, around 200 packets for us. Yes. We as urban people who are the biggest polluters need to be able to get access to it. Um, I have a lot of respect for anyone who takes up such a cause. Safe soil is absolutely needed. Um, we call it Bhumi Supotion. They call it, he's calling it safe soil. Whatever, however, the word goes out. It is a dire situation. Uh, the carbon content, the minimum carbon content of soil should be three. Right now, in India, it has come down to 0.01. This is also a case of upyog versus upbhog. In the last 50, 60 years, we went, um, the, during the Green Revolution, it was great for us, but it was bad. It was great for them, it was bad for us. Uh, we started using nitrogen-based fertilizers, chemical fertilizers. It created a lot of green crops, but it reduced the carbon content. Our organic way of doing it, Indian way of doing it, we have forgotten that. We used to have a few cycles of uh, crops. We never used to have only one crop all the time. And depending on the area, we used to have the crop. We would not grow sugar cane in North Karnataka. We used to grow ragi. Where has ragi gone? Ragi is healthy. Why are we not eating ragi? Why are we eating sugar cane based these juices? Why are we using sugar? It itself is bad for us. But yes, absolutely what he is saying and doing is needed. Um, it is a dire situation and we need to go back to our olden ways of doing it. And I keep repeating, we are very lucky to be Indians because we already have that knowledge. We know how to increase the carbon content of earth. There are certain parts in India where they would grow one crop a year because that soil didn't have the capacity to grow multiple crops a year. So depending on the area and depending on where they are, every community has its knowledge. We have to ensure that we are not losing that knowledge. This fertilizer problem is actually even worse because it is creating uh, cancer. Just yesterday I was reading that uh, because of the Sri Lankan problem, uh, India, Indian tea suppliers are trying to take over that uh, supply chain. But a lot of countries are sending back our products because we are using too many fertilizers and pesticides. Yes. So very good program that he is doing. I very much respect him for doing this.
So on a funny note, I will say that um, China, <laughs> but that's just a funny note. You should not, I don't think you should uh, mandate that every person should only have one child and if you have another child, you should give it away. Uh, there are many uh, organizations and associations that are working for it. Uh, this is increase in population is directly related to malnutrition and health. And um, what do you call that? Infant, um, how infant mortality, sorry. So if infant mortality decreases, if malnutrition in that first five years decreases, then the rate of birth, birth rate per mother also decreases. It is very directly linked to that. So people who have been organizations that have been able to do that, and this happened in Gujarat and a few African countries, if I can remember correctly, um, they have been able to reduce it. So that is what we need to work on, that the infant mortality has to reduce. I guess it's a psychological thing that if, my, if I think that maybe my baby might die, so I will have more and more babies just to be able to. I don't have any research on this. So all I can say is, hum do hamara ek best hai. If you want, hum do hamare do. Yes. Thank you so much. Friends, we have heard Shrimati Surabhi Tomar on uh, only one earth, living sustainably in harmony with nature. She has given so many points to ponder over this. Uh, in uh, Sanatan Dharma, it is uh, uh, Pancha Mahayagnas, we uh, always uh, look for it. Bhuta Mahayagna is also one of it. So we are uh, so close to it, environment and all that. But still we have to remember, because many people will not be knowing what is Yagna and what is Bhuta also. No, it's not, Deva and Bhutas are there now. Bhuta Maha Yagna is there in the environment only. So we have to practice it and take it forward to our future generation also. So many things she has told and I think it's a good topic for pondering over it in our future and I thank uh, Shrimati Surabhi Tomar for having accepted our in invitation and uh, gave a lecture for this uh, wonderful uh, day environment, environment day. So I thank on behalf of Indian Institute of World Culture and also on behalf of all of us present here and also the people who are uh, seeing on the YouTube. So I thank her and uh, we'll conclude this program. Om Shanti. <laughs>